isn't it ideal if people don't reach a point of crisis in the first place? So what what can we do to support everybody, not just and especially people that are more vulnerable? Uh, and I think you gotta have a place to go. You know, you gotta have a place to go, a place to connect with people. You need people, you need place, and you need purpose. So if people can raise their hands and hold on one sec because we do have folks out there. Okay. Sorry, thanks. I was just wondering um, how many times have you shown this film so far? Because I saw a 2022 copyright on it, so I thought, oh, it just. So it, uh, let's see, it came out at Hot Docs in Toronto in 2021 of April. And it's been, it's, we're done with the festival circuit, so it's screened at maybe 30 some festivals. Uh, and then we had our broadcast on PBS and our rebroadcast already. So it's kind of, you know, we've been working on um, engagement screenings, doing a lot of screenings in Cook County and Chicago, uh, particularly with judges. Um, and this film has actually become a part of their training for Cook County judges, which is really fantastic. I have a comment and uh, then a question. Um, I think the applause, the heartfelt applause that we heard uh, is a testament to uh, what a wonderful, exquisite, uh, sensitive, informative um, movie this uh, was. And it uh, covered a lot of the uh, uh, territory. It was uh, alternately uh, painfully and joyfully evocative, and sometimes the two together. Um, I have a movie. I have a question for the uh, videographer, filmmaker, um, and, and it's partly personal. Um, the uh, how did, how is the decision made as to w when you do? and do not use subtitles. Is it the, an economic decision, an artistic decision? Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it to for you to go on from there. I was just wondering, wondering about that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's completely up to the filmmaker. My film before this was set in the rural south. So people in Chicago, for example, have a very hard time understanding them. But what I did was I put subtitles up front with the feeling that your ears would tune in and you'd start to understand them better, and I pulled them away. Because I also think it's disrespectful to say, well, this person is speaking English, but you can't understand them. Well, you need to listen better. And I remember having an audience that was like, I wish you'd subtitled the whole film. And I, you know, I'm not going to tell them that I think, well, maybe you need to listen better. You know, but that's my feeling about it is I don't want to be disrespectful, but, um, you know, sometimes Gina, for example, will say things and I want to make sure you understand and have heard her and she can be more um, difficult to understand. Sometimes it is, you know, I filmed this all primarily where I was running my own sound. So if I don't have a sound person with me, there are challenges and limitations to what I can do. So even with a good sound mix, sometimes maybe the dialogue isn't as clear as I had wanted it to be. So then I would add a subtitle, and it wouldn't even be, a, you know, for any other reason than that. Rob, um, I realize I blew in the introduction. Um, Dr. Weissman is a uh, forensic psychiatrist, um, has been very involved in a broad spectrum of, of forensically related psychiatric issues. Um, can you say a little bit about uh, the court situation here, um, how it works? Uh, certainly it was playing a role here. But what's it like in Rochester? Sure. Uh, first, I, I just want to commend Margaret uh, for the wonderful film. Uh, supremely evocative for me. I trained in Chicago. Uh, I walked on those streets. I worked at Cook County Jail. Um, and it uh, brings me back. I have family in Chicago. It was uh, 
quite an emotional roller coaster as I watched this. And a couple of things struck me, and then I'll get to the court system here because it's just too valuable what you've done. Um, the imagery you used, I, I love film, and uh, I'm uh, jealous of what great work you did here. Um, the imagery that captured the emotions of these people um, was what struck out to me, uh, what stuck out to me, that as a clinician, I saw you looking at the perspective for yourself and the people that you involved in the film. Uh, it evoked their mood, it evoked their confusion, it evoked their, their excitement when things went well, it evoked their shame in the court, uh, which is something that I witness. Because from the clinical side or the legal side, there's always a desire to say, oh, this is the best thing, right? We're engaging people, we're gaining therapeutic leverage, we're, we're uh, capturing people, keeping them out of trouble, and we're successful. The other side, though, is really demonstrated here where you have people just like anyone else who had the vicissitudes of life, the amplitude and changes, the emotional roller coasters only amplify so much with people with mental health concerns, substance-related concerns, that the feelings of shame and desire for independence are taken away. There's a trade-off for these. And even though I think it's useful, I realize that everyone here are human beings. And to me, the take home on this, this film and documentary was, as you said at the very end, this is about connection. This is about people dealing with people. And you formed through the filmmaking a connection with these people that was second to none, more than I think any clinician could. And uh, the power of it was immense. So I just commend you on that, uh, unbelievable. So well done. The court system. Once again, uh, are, we have institutions, but they matter about the people in them and what they do. And you've got a sensitive judge here. You have a judge who commends and rewards and also holds people accountable. And Judge Elliott, who uh, was invited, could make it tonight, uh, exemplifies that Judge John Elliott in our court system here in Monroe County. And I've had the pleasure to work with him for about 15 years. And this is an individual who's sensitive to the needs for people, as you demonstrated here with the judge in Cook County, that understands it because of a personal experience. Uh, most of us who got involved in the clinical or legal side that do this work have a personal experience with mental health concerns, whether it's family or relatives or friends, as does the judge. And these are the people we want to seek out to run these programs if we are going to utilize them uh, because only those folks can understand it. The court system here, I think, is both sensitive, uh, but it's not the panacea. It's a piece of it. And it's not for everyone. You have to choose wisely. You have to know when to press and when to let go. And the desire with what we all work with, which is, it's all about graduation. We heard that, right? The judge wants graduation. The clinicians look forward to graduation. The clientele in the court want graduation. But that's a transition in a very challenging, risky time, as you very clearly illustrated in this, and I see as a clinician. Um, it is the most risky time. And because of our em emphasis on let's graduate, people are at risk, and we have to be careful and cautious. You know, when we're celebrating, and you know all too well how this can be uh, such a, such a tightrope. So I'll stop talking, but the, it, it takes the village to do this work, but we have to treat the clientele as people, and that gets lost in the system. We're all so busy. There's so much demand. There's not enough access. There's not enough services. There's a couple of jewels right, like, like this program and what we have in Monroe County, but there's not enough. And uh, so my, my finish will be uh, with this was, you showed that confusion in the film. You showed the lack of the cohesiveness of the system, even in a good program, um, and that we have a lot of work to do. So thank you for your work.
question for the filmmaker and also for the psychiatrist. For the filmmaker, how did you identify and pick the clients that you had in the film? And for the psychiatrist, I couldn't help but notice unbelievable amount of smoking on the part of the patients and their families. Is this atypical? I actually started smoking. I did. I did start smoking and um, I quit after I finished filming. But I started because I just was, around. I mean, I was already smoking. It's the meters in his bedroom smoking cigarettes. I was like, give me one of those. <laughs> uh, now I forgot the question. How did you pick how did, oh, how did I pick them? Yeah. So it took me eight months to find all three of them. I interviewed um, a couple dozen people, maybe, uh, but I also worked with the mental health court team and the judge to understand, you know, they have their, you know, they have a much deeper understanding of all their, their history and everything. So is this a good, will this be good for them to participate in, or could this potentially be harmful? And there were some people, they're like, I don't. I don't think it's a good idea that you work with them. And then, you know, I also had to get um, special permission from the Illinois Supreme Court uh, in order to film these specialty programs. And that took, it took quite a while. So every single case had to be uh, approved through the Illinois Supreme Court and go all the way up to that chain and then back to me. So that's why I wasn't able to get early, you know, like Daniel, for example, you never actually see him in court. You just see his graduation because it took me so long to get those permissions. Oh, and then how did I pick them? I guess I really wanted to represent the diversity of the court and the really the vulnerable population that was um, getting arrested, being treated in jail, and, and being recommended for this program. And I felt like they really represented uh, that that population. Yeah, just to, to add on, I, what, in my experience of doing outreach work with uh, folks like this, um, what you, you capture is the impact of, of illness and co-occurring disorders, not only on the individual, but how important that is to the family and children, and uh, that we can't just, in the clinical side, work with the person. We have to anticipate that bigger realm and obviously people here understand that uh, firsthand. Um, in terms of the, the nicotine, uh, a couple of things. Uh, just to touch on substance related disorders and why do we see so much of that. Um, I've come maybe after 25 years of doing this and not having a lot of wisdom about it but trying to learn a little bit is uh, the majority of people I think with any chronic illness, not just mental health disorder, uh, are lonely. And substances provide some level of comfort in that loneliness. Either it takes them away for a moment or gives them an altered state so that that pain is not existential for a short time. Certainly the consequences are big. And I guarantee you know the folks that you work with here know that. But that doesn't mean they may not pursue it because loneliness is so painful. Nicotine is a little bit different. Nicotine in the essence of people with serious mental health disorders can be stimulating, can help with cognition and focus, particularly when folks like myself prescribe medications that help dull all that stuff, right? So I think about myself, uh, what are my habits? When I get up in the morning, I can't function until I have a cup of coffee, right? Truly, the first sip, which is not physiologic, I have a sip of coffee, I'm like, oh, I feel better, <laughs> right? Uh, nicotine serves that, and we see with this particular group of individuals, there's a predilection of smoking. Uh, over, there's not a lot of chewing tobacco. Uh, it provides a nicotine receptor activity so that people can feel energetic, alive, counter the medications, and it also, smoking, has an addictive quality, of course, a significant addictive quality that replaces loneliness as well. So there's a touch of it. But, excuse me, so that, that's some of the explanation. 
the biggest concern, just tangent to that, I saw when our hospitals and clinics were going no smoking, right? No smoking policies. Imagine that. Um, we all think it's better as clinicians. People shouldn't smoke, right? We learned all that, and most late individuals know that. But you are now taking a very severe addiction and breaking it and forcing it. And you're already dealing with someone who is disrupted, who is anxious, who is depressed, who is hopeless. And that is not no small feat. And I worried when that day came, I think in the early 2000s, when our hospitals were going no smoking and our clinics followed. So um, that's no small issue. I'm glad you recognize that. Um, and that uh, to close, as in, in the clinical realm, we try to help folks, whether it's folks that I see or people with COPD and other medical concerns, to uh, find alternates or help them with cessation. Nicotine replacement therapy, like Nicorette gums and patches and those kind. Uh, and actual addiction programs to help people withdraw. Because it's, as Keith Richards said from the Rolling Stones, it was harder to quit smoking than it was to get off heroin. Okay. So think about that for a moment. I think we'd also have to point out that the life expectancy for people with schizophrenia is a good 20 years less than the general population. And a very large part of this is back up. If, if you're bored one day, just Google uh, stats about uh, mental health and cigarette smoking and look at the proportion of cigarettes sold to people with mental health and or chemical dependency concerns. Uh, it's astounding. And of course, these are the folks who don't have the, the funds to support the cost of these agents. So it's really divergent rays in terms of health care. Hi, <laughs> great film. I wanted to ask Dr. Wiseman, <clears throat> getting back to the mental health court, and all three of the people that were featured had, of course, the underlying substance abuse. Do you have any statistics about how many, yeah, people that come through mental health court also have the, you know, both dual diagnosis? You bet. And thanks for the question. And again, I don't want to filibuster this because. This is the star of the show here, but um, the so we we started a program some years back that you're well aware of called Project Link, and that's a uh, an assertive community treatment program that dealt only with individuals who are justice involved, either at risk of incarceration, coming out, or incarcerated. So in that cycle, a revolving door, we calculated co-occurring disorders, substance-related disorders, in over 90% of our enrollment. Now that's a select group, but if you look at folks with mental health concerns overall, minus substance related concerns, it's probably 40 or 50 percent conservatively, uh, goes up considerably, and it, it vacillates, right? People get back on the cigarettes, they quit when they're on inpatients or forced abstinence, very difficult. But I want to reiterate that, how important is where we saw these individuals end up back in the hospital back in the hospital. And each time, all that smoking they were doing, they had to stop until they got privileges, which are rare these days. Um, and you can imagine how stressful that might be. I mean, you hear Angela say it. Right. I can't even have a cigarette. Can't you know, even like... have a cigarette. So no small issue. But the substance-related disorders uh, in crime in general, minus take out the mental health concern, uh, the underpinning of most crimes is uh, substance related. Substance use, sub substance acquisition, sales, and withdrawal. It's in there. It's in the recipe. So until we get a handle on that, which will be hard, because I think our society is challenged with loneliness when we really look at some of these concerns and stress and rapidity of response that we can't, our brains aren't set up for. So that's a little side tangent, but I, I really liked how you presented that because that is a every day for people. And it's statistically, it's 85%, about 85% in the mental health courts have dual diagnosis. So you see each, yeah, so in all of the stories, you see that they're, they each have a dual diagnosis. And, you know, for Daniel right now, his, his biggest struggle has never been 
his schizophrenia, really. It's been maintaining his sobriety and his diabetes. Yeah. Hi. Um, great film. Um, I think it touches upon the revolving door of people with mental illness going into the, the criminal justice system and coming for treatment and then going back into the criminal justice system, which is definitely a problem. However, I wonder if you would have a proposition for your next film <laughs> on mental illness, which is even more of a greater minority of people with mental illness that are high functioning. Those, I, I saw a little bit of it with uh, Demeter. He had a bachelor's degree. What about those who find themselves in college struggling with mental health disorders and get diagnosed with for example, that happened to me in college. I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Got through college, graduated from the University of Rochester. Now I'm at RIT, um, finishing up my uh, MBA degree. But I've had several relapses throughout the years. My last relapse was in 2014. Um, but since then, I've been overseas to China. I've worked overseas in China as an ESL teacher. So. I don't often tell my story with the, the caveat of, oh, I had mental illness and I did this, but I think it's what's missing from the dialogue is people who are high functioning, who have, you know, college degrees or advanced degrees and who are working professionals who are able to do extraordinary things that society tells people with mental illness that they can't do. Um, thank you. That, I mean, your story and you sharing your story is very powerful. It's very powerful because you don't even know how many people it's affecting in what ways. I mean, I wasn't going to put myself in the film at all. But that's why I put myself in the film is to say this is not just about them. It's about all of us. And if I'm going to make an honest film, then how can I not say that this is why I'm making the film? Because I'm actually doing it to get out of this major depression episode that I'm in, you know, and um, as an act of connecting with people that make sense to me in some way, even though they don't seem to make sense to anybody else, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that is a uh, important um, aspect for sure. And and I think the power of you sharing your story is, is um, has so much value too. Um, this is a question from Jack Goldstein to Robert. He says, I know you spent time in Chicago. Have you been to Cook County Jail? Yes. Uh, so I trained at Loyola Medical Center, which is in Maywood, Illinois. Just I was born there. Were you? <laughs> so, uh, was there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were a beautiful baby. Yeah. That was in the late 80s. Late 80s, uh, yeah. So I was there in the 90s, early 90s for four years. Early 90s. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, not only uh, in my training uh, as a resident, psych resident, uh, I worked at Cook County Jail, um, and I was uh, used to moonlight. So as a resident, you know, to pay your your fees in Chicago, where the housing is a lot worse than it is here in Rochester, uh, I usually took on some some moonlighting work. And I worked at Pontiac Correctional Center, which is a maximum security facility, a la Attica, um, in that kind of turn of the century. And I always tell my fellows and residents and students, I learned more about people and mental health at, at those facilities than I did in all of my training. Um, it's a crucible for human behavior, uh, and not most of the time in a bad way. Um, and it really got me interested in doing this work because of the plight of people who really shouldn't be in jail and prison for survival-type behavior, right? Most of these folks are just trying to make it. And just as we would if we were in their situation and get caught up in this cycle. Uh, so the one thing I remember about Cook County Jail vividly was day one, we went in there and we would do medication management for the inmates. Uh, there was a, a restraint room. Uh, most of you are aware of what a seclusion or restraint room is. Uh, it's where someone goes who is likely out of control. And the difference from where I was in the hospital was this was a 
steel a welded bed that was bolted to the floor with bolts like you would mount a large machine and the shackles were steel and the chains to the shackles were steel um, and I remember that capturing I looked at that and I looked at the the warden and I said is that for show or do people really go in there and he said uh, people go in there because the normal restraint beds people will rip out of and you know and those are heavy leather and, and fiber and nylon and to me that was that was a turning point in my perspective of what went on in the justice system or the correctional system for people who are out of control and no more common about it but the perception of inhumanity was pretty large and how how could this be a place for people who are having these disturbances and consequences of, of an endogenous illness um, so uh, that was my first impression of Cook County Jail. The second impression was they have a large field where inmates will go and, you know, take if they get time out. And there was a large basketball court. I'll never forget it from my vantage point. The basketball court was this large asphalt, real rough kind of facility, no nets on the, on the hoops. And there were 9,000 inmates within that quadrangle. And they were standing like sardines, person to person, their arms closed together. There were four inmates to a cell that were de devised for two inmates. Okay. So you wonder, you know, how could someone who has serious mental health concerns, paranoia, misperceiving reality, severe depression, you can't function if you were not suffering from these things. So that really was the impetus for me. And that's why Cook County Jail, uh, sort of gave me the chills when I saw that uh, come up here. I knew I would, um, and it brought me right back. So, very vivid portrait. I, I'm sure there are all kinds of decisions about editing and filming that go in that, that totally went over my head, but I had to say one that I noticed that I thought was brilliant. One of the, um, I think it was Daniel, said something about with mental illness, you know, you feel like everyone is leaving you and you're left all alone. And then you cut to a roof with pigeons and they all fly away except one that stays there. Yeah, that, that was just fabulous. Thank you for noticing that. Every, every movie I make, I put a bird shot in. I do, and that was one of my favorites, yeah. While we're getting the question, I wondered also, because that's, I was really focusing on the imagery and your transitions. Uh, you showed the airplane a lot. You showed the sky, and I remember from Chicago living there that you don't have a horizon most of the time. You, you catch a little glimpse of the sky, and I wonder if there was more to that. Or well, as a pastime, me and Demeter, he, he would come with me, and we'd, we'd, we'd sit out there, and we'd film the planes, because you've got to sit there and wait for them. And he lives by the airport, which he says in the film, and it also represents, it's a metaphor because it represents his desire to want to escape, escape his illness, escape his life. When he's manic, he, um, he, he travels. He, he went north and he went to, you know, he ended up in Wisconsin and that's when he went missing and broke into the power plant, you know, because he thought he was a Navy SEAL. There, there was uh, several scenes about this where he had met this other guy, Nick, who was also manic at the time they didn't know each other were manic. And so he goes back to visit Nick because he, after he, he ends up leaving this guy, Nick, and stealing his stuff and then ends up getting arrested. So he never speaks to him again. And when, when they, when they meet up again, I, you know, it's a, it's this wonderful scene that just has never, you know, didn't make it into the film. But, um, he goes, he's like, so you're not really a Navy SEAL? <laughs> Like, they really believed in each other. And they were just out there caught wreaking havoc together, you know. But it was also really sad because, you know, you see that Nick isn't really doing well either. You know, he, he can't work. Um, he lost his job. And, and he's actually a really nice person. And you see his mom is, is not doing so well. And, and that's probably why Nick isn't doing so well, you know. So... So, Margaret, you finished filming before COVID. How did your friends deal with COVID and the isolation 
that happened. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think back to that time because I block it out. I, I mean, I was still filming through COVID, but we just didn't show it. Um, and I, we, we always, I always saw them. Uh, Angela, I helped Angela get a job at a, a COVID testing center. She was working at a COVID testing center for a while. Um, yeah, Daniel, nothing much changed for him. He still was getting his services, seeing the friends that he met through the services, you know, hanging out with them. And yeah. Um, Margaret, I really appreciate your honesty with the filming, as painful as it was, to see the, the cycling up and down. Um, and I was very relieved that we ended on a positive note for everybody, and I hope that continues. But I think it highlights the weakness in the system, surely, that you know it's not enough to get to graduation, as the doctor has so well pointed out. So I think my question is unanswerable, um, at this point at least, but you know, what more can be done to support these people over time? And I love that the judges are seeing this as part of their training and wondering if you're seeing any impact there um, and maybe just what your hope is with bringing this film to light. Um, as far as the impact of, of, you know, screening the film, I think with judges, it has had a personal impact for me, which is that it's helped me to negotiate access into the criminal courts where I've been filming for the last five years. And um, it wasn't until recently that I realized that they don't let everybody do that. Uh, because people are asking me, like, how are you doing this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Just, you know. And, and, uh, and I have gotten kicked out and still let back in. Um, and what was the other, the first question? What can be done? I mean, I think, isn't it ideal if people don't reach a point of crisis in the first place? So what, what can we do to support everybody, not just, and especially people that are more vulnerable? Uh, and I think you gotta have a place to go. You know, you gotta have a place to go, a place to connect with people. You need people, you need place, and you need purpose. And so how do we support the people around us to have those things? And, and I, I think for what I learned from this film is that little things matter. So me having lunch with Daniel, that matters. And I know it's important to him. It's important to his sister. Um, he's actually struggling a little bit now. So, and I know about it, but his sister called me. And it's not because I can really do anything, but she just said, can you come over for dinner one night? You know, because he goes there on the weekends. And I said, sure. Just because you're present. Just be present. That I think little things matter. Thank you. My question is for Margaret, although you've really just talked about some of it. I wondered uh, about the steps from when your movie was made to when it was um, incorporated into training for the judges. I mean, that's quite something. If you could talk about that and how the success, did you work with uh, an agency or? No, it was really through personal connections uh, and Judge Edidin, who was really instrumental in wanting to see this film get into, um, get into the training of, of other Cook County judges. But really it was once people saw the film and saw that it's highlighting the mental health court program, mm -hmm. they want to show that. Even though it doesn't show it as this perfect, you know, I feel that it's an authentic look at what it is and they appreciated it. And so how often is it that a judge gets to say, this is some positive work I'm doing? Because she's also sitting in, on, you know, and hearing murder trials and feeling threatened and, you know, like all these other things. But here's something she can be proud of that is her legacy. And she, you know, wants to amplify, not just because it's her legacy, but because this is the work that she wants to see more of. 
And I think um, she talks a lot about how people will say, how is it that you have so many people graduating from your mental health court program? And in the four other districts, we don't see it. And it's, she says, because I want to see them succeed, and I don't send them back to jail unless I have to. And, and other judges, even the judges that run the mental health courts, they don't have that, um, I, I don't know what it is, patience or, um, I don't know what you'd call it. No, you, you captured it so right, and, and I can speak for uh, Judge Elliott. Um, it's the sensitivity, and you said that, that incarceration is a last resort, and that there are graduated sanctions and more frequent visits to clinicians and various other ways to deal with, you know, potential violations, if you will, or transgressions. And uh, the judge also does a couple things that I saw this judge did. And I, it, we travel around the country and try to help some of these courts, and I've noticed a couple different things. And one is, uh, what Judge Elliott shares a story is he has one uh, client who came through and she wrote the judge a note at graduation day and said, nobody has ever believed in me, and you did, and that was the difference. Um, and, you know, we take it for granted. Everyone gets a star on their forehead every other day around here, right? Uh, these folks don't. And that had someone of authority and position believing in them was the ticket to ride. And the Judge Elliott uh, shared that with us. And it was quite impactful. Uh, my name is Jim. My wife, Pat, and I. Well, first of all, I thought your movie was tremendous. It was real. It, it was any given day. I mean, that happens day in and day out. And we have spent a lot of time in, in the prison system of New York State and in the local county jails, uh, facilitating groups over the years. And one of the things, and, and I have been both a volunteer and a paid employee of, a, of an organization, and it took years, but now we're able to take, we facilitate the groups, we take individuals and we have codependent individuals. Most of them are um, either drug dependent, alcohol dependent, or, or as you mentioned, that, that's mostly what sends people into prison. But we take them from there into housing that is first a very um, pretty strict program with very rigorous rules that they have to sign a contract before they leave the, um, the institution and come to us to agree to. But then we have, a, it's holistic. We go from there to where they can, they get into their programs, whatever they need. Um, we have case managers that stick with them. Then, then we have apartments they can go to or, or um, and, and after that, we actually have, uh, we help them get employment. We help them work at getting into college, whatever they feel their, their long-term goals are. And we had, at the time, it's been a while, but we had a 15% recidivism um, oh, as measured over two years for individuals that came through our program. I think one of the differences, it was, it was holistic. It was like the biopsychosocial model. It, 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 it connected all the dots. These individuals that we worked with were not alone. They had, you know, folks that worked in our organization connect them with whoever they needed. And, the, and now it's to the point that those individuals stay with them, assuming they want them to, throughout the rest of their journey for as long as they want them. And one of the things your movie painted very, very well was how that does not exist in, in, in most real life. I mean, the hospitals don't talk to the nursing homes and the, the criminal justice system doesn't talk to the hospitals. And, you know, so what, if I was a billionaire with, with unlimited funds, where would I put it to try to make that happen in real life? When has money ever solved anything, though? Uh, that's what I just said. I don't know. <laughs> just because money is the root of all evil, too. With those words of wisdom, <laughs> so, um, can't thank both of you enough. Uh, it's been a wonderful evening. The, the film, obviously, was terrific. Um, the next meeting of the congregation will be uh, a week from Friday. Uh, we'll, the place will be open at 5 o'clock. We will be starting with an art show from the Creative Wellness Opportunities uh, Gallery. And... Um, if it's keeping with our past experience, 
there's going to be some absolutely sensational art that you'll get to see, um, followed by a one-woman play, um, which I've been able to see and is remarkable as Adina Taubman uh, talks about her battle with depression. Um, it will be wonderful. So uh, that'll be a week from Friday here, 5 o'clock for the art show, 7 o'clock for the play. Come on down. And again, thanks to you. Oh, can I add one thing? Uh, so you can go to our website at anygivendayfilm.com. There's a community guide there if you're interested in uh, screening the film. It's going to be available digitally soon, meaning, you know, iTunes, Amazon, all, all those. And then if you're interested in hosting screenings or sharing the film, you know, certainly send along uh, our information, which is on the website, anygivendayfilm.com. You can contact us that way. Thank, and thank you for coming.